All right, I think we are now live, everybody, which is very, very cool. I'm going to welcome everybody in just a moment. So stand by while we um, admit people into the room. And uh, we are, we're going to have so much fun today talking about all this songwriting stuff. It's so cool. So uh, let me get my software organized over here so I can keep an eye on our chat as well. There we go. So it looks like we're live on Facebook and YouTube and a few other places as well, which is very cool too. Hey, Brendan, good to see you. Kathleen, Mary, Laura. And we'll have some more. We had about um, 40 or 50 registered, so hopefully we'll have some more in our Zoom room. And if you're watching live on any of our channels, uh, great to see you. And uh, please, wherever you are, feel free to say hi in the chat. Let us know where you're from. Um, and if you've got any questions at any time too, we would love to know about them. So you're welcome to put any questions down as we go. Um, and we'll try and come to those as we can. Uh, so um, I'll kick it off by firstly just welcoming welcoming everybody and Simon in particular, Nicole who's on our team, Beck who's also on our team and one of our members um, and all of you guys out there. It's just great to be able to connect. I know it's online and virtual but uh, still a fantastic opportunity to connect on su such a fun topic um, and we're going to dive into today a little look at um, some of the resources that Simon's created for us to help us with this songwriting question. Um, but the, the whole genesis of this actually came about when uh, we, we created the Four Chord Composing course, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago. And the Four Chord Composing course was all about how to take pop song style chord structures and help your students create their own versions of that. And it's been hugely popular and teachers around the world have had so much fun with it. Um, and students have learnt a lot in the process because they can make these great connections between chords in their songs, chords in pop songs, how to make chord progressions, and then the harmony and the repertoire pieces they're learning. So it's a really great um, exploration of, of harmony for them. But I often got asked, what's next? Well, like I've done four chord composing, what, what can I do now? Can I kind of build this into a song? And we've never really had that next step in the process until now and that's why I've been so excited to have Simon who has created this course really looking at songwriting from a top-down perspective and by top-down I mean melody and lyrical perspective whereas my course was much more about harmony up and as Simon says in the course there's no right or wrong way of creating songs and songwriting. Uh, these are two methods, but they link together brilliantly. So whether or not you've explored four chord composing or not, totally fine. Um, you're going to get lots out of um, what we talk about and share today. Um, and I have to say that I've I was just saying, I feel like I know Simon so closely because I've spent so much time with him recently going through this course. And I know some 30 of our members or so have started this course and they're having a great time with it. He's such a great um, presenter and teacher. And it's the first time I've really felt confident coming up with lyrics or trying it out myself because I'm just not a lyricist. And Simon has given me the confidence to be able to do that with this step-by-step -step kind of process. So that's been great. All right, so who is Simon? Um, Simon Rushby's a music education expert, teacher, performer, composer, and ABRSM examiner, and an author who's taught music in schools across Southeast of England. With over 30 years of experience in leading UK schools as a director of music, he's worked with many students of all levels. He's published several education resources. You may know he's Discovering Music Theory, um, which is an ABRSM exam prep series. As a composer, Simon has written songs that have charted for Europe, um, sorry, artists in Europe and Asia, and compositions that have been used worldwide for TV shows and commercials. And as a performer, Simon remains busy as a pianist and keyboard player and musical director. I don't know how you do all this, Simon. I really don't. He also plays keyboards in a number of highly respected pop, rock, and jazz bands. So you can see all of these um, skills come together in this course. And has conducted like performances. Really. <laughs> <laughs> and he's conducted performances of a vast range of choral and orchestral music, both with student and adult ensembles and choirs. Simon, welcome to. Um, Thank you. I feel like it's like this is your life or something, but uh, welcome. <laughs> yeah, I did feel a bit like that. Thank you for that. Amazing introduction, Tim. Uh, it's great, great to be here. Thanks for, thanks for coming along, everyone, especially if you've got up at ridiculously early hour to, to be here. That's uh, kudos to you because uh, that's quite something. 
Yeah, let us know in the chat if you're up earlier than um, Beck and me uh, at 6 a.m. Um, if there's anyone in Perth or anywhere in Asia, let us know. <laughs> let us know. It's going to be quite early for you guys. So, Simon, I want to um, go through and start unpacking some of this course so we can give some teachers some, some tips um, right away. But what was your intention when you started putting this together? Um, well, I think, I think I, I asked myself that question before we started, before I started uh, even planning it. What do I what would I want to get out of the course on songwriting? And I, I started thinking back to when I first started doing it myself and uh, actually having to learn everything um, as I went along, um, never having been taught it. I think when I was at school, composition was kind of taught reactively. So, you know, you, you wrote my composition teacher told me, write, write a piece uh, and then bring it to me and we'll talk about it. And that was pretty, pretty much how the lessons went. You know, there was always plenty to talk about because I'd go away and I'd write absolute drivel and bring it in. And then he'd, he'd basically pull it to pieces and then I'd go away feeling very low about my ability. And then we'd, we'd go around again. So I thought, well, there's got to be um, with case of pop songwriting, there's got to be some really easy ways to get students motivated to write. Uh, so it's it's really about just, um, you know, dispelling the theory that you can't teach people how to be creative. Um, you can, and uh, it's really simple. There's lots of really simple ways of doing it, especially if you start with the basics. Um, and if you, if you show to students how simple it is, uh, then it gets them all excited about what they can create themselves. Mm. And um, I, I have to ask this question because you come up through this course, you write a song and it, the funniest thing was, Simon, that I would, I would watch a module and then go off and make a cup of tea or do something in the house and I'd be humming your song <laughs> and I, it, was, it was so annoying but it was so obvious that these tactics that you're giving us about repetition and simplicity and the melodic, um, the notes that you're choosing to use, they really do work. But I have to ask, did you really not have any idea of what was going to come through this course? No, genuinely, genuinely didn't. Um, <laughs> and I think if you look at the module where I first come up with the melody, hopefully that shows um, because the whole point was to try and show uh, that you with a pentatonic scale, which is how we came up with that particular melody, literally just with those. Can you hear that okay? Yeah, it could make it a bit louder. A bit louder? Yeah, no problem. If you can. Um, That's better. So basically with those with those five notes, just literally wiggling your fingers, you can come up with a, a phrase. There's a phrase. Now, second phrase, let's do it with one note different at the end. There we are, we've now got the first two lines of our new melody. And, and it just ha it just happens like that so quickly. Um, and then it's about trying to make it original and trying to do your own thing with it so that it doesn't end up sounding like something that's already been being written. But, mm. but, but yeah, it's just giving you those, it, it, I was trying to prove, and it was a slightly risky way of doing it, but I suppose I could have just reshot the video if nothing came out. Um, it, was trying, <laughs> it was trying to prove that, um, you know, if you, if you go about it in a really simple way with a few hard and fast rules, then you can do it, anyone can do it. Mm. And it, it was good to see you do this on the spot because you'd kind of, you'd play something and then kind of smile. It was like, oh, that, that actually worked really well. And so you could, you can experience this as, as a process with you, which was really, quite, it was kind of addictive actually. So I, I've kind of, I kind of warn people, this course is a little bit Netflix-like. You, you may want to binge it because you, it's going to see this process unpacking in front of your eyes and unfolding. And then you're going to be able to go and do it yourself and with your students, which I think is the coolest thing. The other thing, Simon, that your, you know, your vast experience and knowledge and the depth of your understanding of music and education means that one of the things that I learned the most about was all the connections you made to not only other pop songs, but um, traditional folk tunes, uh, Schubert in one of the early, uh, early modules, and just how similar all these people and composers are in so many ways. It's not like we're building a new rocket to go to Mars. This has been done before and there is a process. I think that was one of the biggest takeaways for me. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it, they're all coming from the same place. 
whether it's Bach, Mozart, Schubert, Gershwin, Ed Sheeran, um, Freddie Mercury, or you know Paul Simon, whoever uh, Adele, whoever it happens to be, uh, they're all coming from the same place and they're all trying to do the same thing and they're all working with the same material. Um, you know the twelve notes of the of the chromatic scale. That's all we all have. Uh, mm -hmm. unless unless we're in you know unless we're working in a culture where there's more than 12 notes so, so yeah it, they all doing they all did the same thing and i wanted to really show that for two reasons really one to to sort of help it, it does help you to understand it if you can interconnect everything that you already know and make it relevant to something new that you're doing um so if you know if you if you know if, if you know a bit of schubert that you play on the piano and that can be linked to the process of writing your own melody then that's that's going to be great because it's going to give you that context. And also it just for students, it helps to make them understand better why they do the things that you ask them to do in, in music lessons, like learning pieces by composers who are alive 400 years ago or mm. practicing scales or whatever it might be. Just find, finding that finding that that's all relevant to something that their favorite pop star does uh, is is priceless, really. Yep, and it comes um, beautifully home to my approach of this integrated approach to music teaching where we make these connections as, as much as we can between old and new and the students' lives, the music they're listening to, uh, what they love and the music that we're trying to teach them. The more of those connections we can make, the better. And, and this songwriting course is absolutely packed full of them. So let's take a quick look through. You start the course um, with modules 1A and B, um, all of, we we're just unpacking songs we're trying to learn about the ingredients of some great songs that are out there so you look at um, both a little bit about the chords but particularly about the rhythmic hooks and the movement um, of the harmony and the melody mainly in amazing grace um, yeah. you mentioned um, bobby mcferrin's video about the pentatonic scale which i think is uh, uh, anyone if you just write down one thing today go and watch that it's, it's so cool isn't it it's so cool I don't, it's kind of impossible, but it works. It's just amazing. And what, Go and watch what's it. super cool about that is he did it at a science convention in front of a bunch of, you know, a bunch of scientists talking about the brain and neuro neurologists. And one of the guys actually said to him as he was doing it, do you want, do you want a job in, neuro, in neuroscience? Because uh, he just, he was showing the power of the pentatonic scale, which is embedded in everybody. Um, and he, he had this, yeah, thousand strong, whatever it was, audience at this, at this TED talk. Uh, in the palm of his hand, uh, singing the melody that he was writing in front of it, him. Yeah, it was quite remarkable. So yeah. Bobby McFerrin, um, Pentatonic Scale, you'll be able to find that one. Um, in, these, in these first couple of modules, you um, have a look at Schubert, as we mentioned, also Gershwin, also Ed Sheeran, and Amazing Grace, and you find these connections between all of these composers, which was remarkable. And I walked away humming that Schubert melody, which I'd never heard before <laughs> as yeah. well. Um, and you talk about hooks and rhythms and steps and jumps. So just a quick overview on that, because I think one of the challenges with songwriting, is we think, oh, there's 88 notes on a piano if we're composing on a piano. How do I know which notes to use? And you just oh, sure. make it so small that we it's yeah. doable. You've got to make it tiny, um, absolutely. And I talk in one of the later modules about minimalism and how bands like Coldplay use that to uh, to come up with some of their stuff. You know, uh, if you know Clocks, which has got the same riff going, going round and round and round. And uh, the melody, I've jumped a bit, but the melody in, in Clocks um, is just, it's just this. five it's five notes five adjacent notes um and the whole verse is just those two phrases over and over again and that's one of the biggest songs you know in cold one of big coldplay's biggest most successful songs um people aren't going to remember your melody if it's got too much in it so you have to you have to get that that uh, balance right between repetition and just enough contrast to make it interesting Although in some, in some songs, there isn't even that, you know, there's, it's just straight repetition. So you have to ask yourself, well, why is that, what's made that so successful? And I say that in the course quite a few times. So don't, don't ask, do I like it? Because that's opinion, which is different from study. Ask yourself, get your students to say, well, this is successful. This song was successful. Why? How did it become successful? 
irrelevant really whether I like it or not. Um, it's the because uh, that's just a matter of taste. But yeah, if you're not, if you're going to uh, Paul, when Paul McCartney came up with yesterday, he, came, he was walking down the street. The story goes, and he had no words, so he sung it to scrambled eggs, scrambled eggs, da, 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 da. and um, he, he realised that the melody was so strong and it had just come come up to him that he couldn't forget it. So he just kept it kept it going as he got back home to a piano. But again, it's just. <laughs> just a succession of scales um, it's just a succession of stepwise movement so in the course I talk about two two key things really keeping the smallest amount of material possible um, try writing a melody with just three notes for example Mary had a little lamb there's only got three notes in it and the second thing is try and keep everything moving in step so that you've got that kind of flow keep the leaps uh, to an absolute minimum. Mm. Uh, I also like um, in, in module three, which is all about tunes that get stuck in your head. This is where you unpack a lot of these in, in depth. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned that songwriting is a bit like drawing. Now, I've never thought of it this way. And when you create a, a masterpiece artwork, uh, an oil paint, let's say, you'll start with the pencil outline to begin, just to sort of shape out, and even the masters did this. And you're, you're suggesting the same, that same thing, just a, a pencil outline, a real, something really basic. You can add more color later on. And I thought that was um, a great tip as well. I also took a quote that you said, don't let anyone tell you that all the chord sequences have been used up in pop. Reuse them and work on the melody. The melody is that crucial thing. Try not to focus so much on the chords. And, um, and then you, that takes us into module four, which is all about writing a great melody. And you can do this with students. Simon makes this simple. If you've never done this before, you will be able to do this. Um, and he bases it on either the pentatonic scale or the other scale is the minor scale, isn't it? First five notes of the minor scale, is that right, Simon? Yeah, um, Aeolian mode <clears throat> uh, or Dorian mode. So Aeolian mode is the white notes from A to A, which we also call the natural minor. So taking out the harmonic and the melodic stuff, which is color, and just leaving leaving the basic natural minor. And the Dorian mode is the D to D mode. And just five, yeah, just five notes. So if we take the first five notes of um, a violin, for example, and just coming up with something. Uh, as a phrase using those notes, there we are. Do you know there's too many notes in that? Um, maybe even would be better. Yeah, so keeping it as minimal as possible. There's a, there's a reasonable first phrase. And then the second phrase could be that. It's quite dark sounding, isn't it, that one? Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, again, it's just using a small amount of material from whatever scale you like and, and coming up with repetitive. If I was going to write that, I'd then repeat it, by the way. I say that quite a lot in the course, just change one thing, but repeat as much as you possibly can. Yeah, that's right. So much repetition. I hadn't realized how much repetition there was, <coughs> excuse me, um, in all these pop songs and Amazing Grace and the songs from history as well. And that also came to the fore. It's like, you don't have to think too hard and make things too difficult. In fact, that's the wrong thing to do because it's then not memorable. It's the reason these things get stuck in your head is because the melodic idea is so simple and repetitive. So then on to module five, you finally talk about lyrics, which I was really interested about because this is just, has always been a pain point for me. Amazing. And you, you smashed through this. Um, and you did say um, you can do words first or chords first, chords or melody first, and all the great, comp you know, there's many composers of our time who do either or both. Um, you mentioned the Elton John oven song. Has everybody, has anybody seen this on YouTube? I had never knew this existed. This was super cool. This is, it, it has to be old. Yeah. 30 years ago or more. Yeah. Elton is in front of an audience and someone gives him the manual for an oven and he creates a song about it on the spot. It is very cool to watch. And it starts in one way and then he changes it up halfway through when he knows the audience isn't quite getting it and he bops it along and uh, it's it's a great one to watch. So that was a great, that was a great takeaway. You can also, search you for that see, one as well. You see uh, Elton John's uh, 
uh, songwriting process right in front of your eyes there as yes. well. And he's diff he's he's um he's more like your four chord composing approach. He, he will he'll start with he'll start with you know da -da -da, and then he'll sing and he'll come up with ideas based on chords he's playing. Um, and and yeah. sort of which is very much what you you do in four chord composing. Yeah, you talked about and the, one of the big things I took away from your course was the way in which you had to play in church and you had to sort of what I was called noodle um, yeah. while, while stuff's going on. And, you know, you have to provide, have to provide the background. Uh, and it is really then knowing a little bit about chords and the way chords work together is, uh, is really helpful for that. And that's, that's, that's his approach. Whereas you ask Billy Joel, he always says melody first and he, he agonizes over the words for weeks on end, which is pretty much what I do. I hate writing lyrics. I find it really hard. Well, you make it look easy uh, and you, you come up with lyrics for this song in one module uh, and these all the modules are about 20 minutes too, by the way. So they're very accessible. Um, and I think, you know, just you just had starting and you gave lots of starting points and ideas and suggestions, again, links to famous other songs that are out there for ideas. So it doesn't always have to be love, um, which is what my initial thought is. I've got to write something about love. Maybe I'm not feeling lovey at the moment or sad. What can I write about? And you've given some suggestions. So yeah, look around uh, the room. Yeah, look out the window. Write a song about trees. I, whatever it might be, you know. But uh, but you're right. And students probably aren't going to buy into the idea of writing love songs first off either, are they? So correct. Uh, yeah. Depending on their age and their and and uh, whatever sort of where whatever sort of context they're coming from. Now speaking about chords, you dive into that um, in episode six, two, three, and four chord wonders. You call this one. Uh, so it was great to explore your approach to the chords, given that that's something that I've always enjoyed as well. Uh, you talk about the circle of fifths, um, Coldplay using two chords in the chorus of Fix You, <laughs> which again, I hadn't really thought about. Four chords yeah. for the verse, only two chords for the whole chorus. And, you know, one of the biggest songs of all time. And there's so many examples of that, isn't there? There's actually um, lots of examples of one chord songs uh as well um you know uh there's um i'm going to cheat slightly here by changing it but there's a bruno mars song called just the way you are which has a riff that goes uh... and i think he then goes and he just changes the bass note with the same chord in the right hand basically all the way through and makes a song out of that so you can even make a song out of out of one chord Yep. That's and then um, <laughs> module seven, parts A and B, uh, don't bore us, get to the chorus. So you talk about um, more ideas there with, um, we add suspensions, talking about passing notes, and then obviously building to the chorus. And that's about where I got up to, Simon. So tell us, there was two more. Um, I had to kind of just flip through because I wanted to do this in depth. Um, the last two modules, what, episode eight, uh, or module eight is key about key changes yeah, and the final key. one is the full fledged song so tell us about those last two modules yeah a stand up for the key changes it's an old joke about how these these boy bands would sing ballads sitting on stools and then they'd all get up when the key changed and walk to the front of the stage <laughs> so that's why it's called stand up for the key change um but uh, it's it talks about it's mainly talks about structure and what to do when you get to that awkward point after your second chorus because in most songs you'll you'll write a verse and a chorus um and then you'll you'll repeat and you'll go verse chorus again with some different words uh and then then it's what next so that that episode eight deals with that it talks about bridges um or middle eights it talks about modulation whether whether you want to uh modulate or not and what it brings to the song and also i explore four or five songs uh, that do change key and look at how they change key. And it's amazing how many of them don't go through any kind of theoretical, classical process for changing key. They just move. So this is very common in pop. Uh, I use Man in the Mirror by Michael Jackson as an example, which is um, the chorus is... Let's turn, it, turn myself up a little bit. Can you hear that all right? So it's, um, I'm talking about the man in the mirror. That's the chorus. And then he goes, um, I'm talking about the And just literally he moves from A, other semitone to B flat without any kind of preparation or 
dominance or any of that that stuff going on. So uh, it's looking at examining a, the, a little bit about key changes in structure. The last one, the fully fledged song, we take our song that we've written all the way through and uh, we complete it. Um, we talk, we do a key change and a bridge. We talk about how to end it and whether it's important to end a song or you know what different ways to do it. Uh, and we we talk about feel and in the uh, all the way through the course, the song has been like a ballad, sort of. That's the song sort of in the ballad, and I turn it round on its head completely in the last one and turn it into a kind of George Ezra like um, um cha um cha um cha song in a different key, just to show that changing the feel um, of, of uh, what you've been dealing with can can sometimes completely transform it. And there are loads of cover versions of of songs that do that. For for example, talk about Michael Jackson. It's a band called Alien Ant Farm that did Smooth Criminal as a heavy heavy metal song. Um, <laughs> just made it sound completely different, and, and it's uh, worth watching. Actually, it's a really really good version. So yeah, uh, we talk about we talk about feel and groove and style and that sort of. I um, I love exploring remixes and uh, remakes of songs. I think it's fascinating what people can do. Uh, and I have to say as well, um, we you've created this. This is an epic uh, resource to go along with this. This is 55 pages. This is Simon's notes for this course. I might even be able to show you on the screen in a minute. Look at this. This is the step-by-step -step guide to songwriting, which I wish I had 20 years ago, <laughs> combined with the course, which I'm going to show you actually online now. Let's just jump in um, and have a look at what the course actually looks like. Um, can you see my screen now, Simon? Mm -hmm, yep. So, so this is um, inside our um, Top Music Pro membership um, dashboard. Uh, we'll jump into the course, which is over here. Um, so this is Simon, this is the introduction to the course, and this is how we lay, lay our, all our courses out. Um, and you can scroll down here and see these are all the modules. So you can see where, I, where I've been up to in my note taking and ex exploration of the course. Uh, but if I jump in, I just thought, here's, here's episode five, just to give you, um, all of you watching, uh, an idea about what the actual course looks like. So you've got the link down here to, to things that Simon's mentioned, but the lesson handout itself. So here's that um, incredible guide, which I was just talking about. And all of the links that Simon talks about are all linked up into this um, incredible handout. So I just had this on the side. Um, I had the my version there so I could take some notes as I went. And oh, there's the Schubert that you were talking about. Um, and we were able to just use that while watching your um, episodes um, as they ran through. And I, as I said, we, we probably shouldn't have called them episodes, Simon, because it did make me feel like I was kind of binging a Netflix series. Um, but here's... Hi, and welcome back. If you remember, we, uh, we ended last session by... So here's, this is the, the topic about getting lyrical and you can also see these chapter marks that we've added here too. So you can flip through to various places um, as Simon's talking about it. And depending on the module too, I mean, there's lots of places where you are um, showing, demonstrating things on screen. So we bring up either the, the score that you're working with, or in this case, you were talking about the chords. So there was information about the circle of fifths. Um, I, was and here's, I, was, I was convinced I was showing that backwards. Uh, yes, I noted that. You could see the backwards version in your screen when you were recording, I think. Um, and here, here's an example with, um, with the score on screen too. And by the way, I always, I always go, um, when I'm recording myself singing and go, oh yeah, I've got a terrible voice and everything like that. And I know you said exactly the same thing, Simon, your voice is actually lovely. Um, so oh, thank you for singing along. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so this is just part of our academy. For those of you who aren't members, I know we've got a lot of members watching as well. This is our Top Music Pro Academy. So this is where the courses, we've got now 50 courses you can see here, um, listed in our academy. <clears throat> If I just click on that one, uh, you'll be able to see all our, our key um, courses that many of you will heard, have heard of, things like Notebook Beginners and Four Chord Composing I mentioned before. Also our business courses too, a course on notation and theory rudiments and group teaching, you know, we, you, you name it, we've probably created a course at some stage about it. 
Uh, and I'm really excited, actually, we've got two recent additions to our membership, and that's um, Anna Marie's springboard sessions. So Sunday night, Monday morning, Sunday night, America, Monday morning, uh, Melbourne, Anna Marie's meeting with all our members and giving her um, some tips and strategies for the week ahead, which is super. And Beck, who's on the call here, um, as well, is doing this forum based um, taking cohorts through the course. Um, and this is just actually a new thing we've um, begun uh, just recently. And so each week, <clears throat> Rebecca and the people who are going through the course are actually able to check in and, and ask questions and things like that. And you can see some of our discussions happening um, down here. And here's, um, yeah, that was, <laughs> that was a look at. I'm still just blown away. It's just such an incredible resource uh, that I really hope people will um, connect with us and um and explore so i want to um let you know how you can actually get access to this incredible resource from simon um, in the meantime if you are on any of our streaming channels please and you've got any questions please uh, ask the question either in facebook or on youtube is fine or if you're in our zoom room here today if you've got any questions for simon any quick tips or strategies students that might be a little bit reticent you've tried this before but it hasn't worked anything like that uh, do let us know and we'll answer those questions before we wrap things up. Um, but let me show you, uh, this is our course um, offer. And um, as I said, the, the, the number of, the, the depth of the resources that you're getting in this course is just, it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, and it's just one of our now 50 courses in the Top Music Pro Academy. I wanted to just mention this, this came up in our forums just recently from one of our members, Rachel, talking about one of our other courses, No Book Beginners. She said, this year I've been using the No Book Beginners method for all of my new students and a majority of these have been in group lessons. I have a sibling group of three who are working together in one class and last week I assigned them the animal improvisation story challenge found in lesson one of No Book Beginners. Today, when they came for their lesson, their mum told me that this was one of the best practice assignments she had ever seen. She said they were literally fighting over who was going to get to practice. It was a great problem to have and they had so much fun. And, and Rachel says, if you haven't given the No Book Beginner method a try, you definitely should. Even if you have students that are not beginners, you can definitely slip various ideas into your lesson as a bit of a brain break from students' harder reading pieces. I thought that was a really great summary of the kinds of courses that we try and create for teachers here that not only bring out that creative side in students, encourages and motivates them to practice, um, and also um, makes these deeper connections for students. So if you'd like to come and get Simon's course, it's inside our studio membership. That's uh, $49 per month. You get full access to this course and all of our other courses and discounts and all of our lesson plans. It's a great bargain, but I'm gonna make it even better for you today. By, if you join us as a new member before the end of October, we're going to offer you the, um, this pricing, which is $39 a month instead of 49. So taking $10 off a month, or if, you want to access our pricing from about four years ago, which was when it was $29 a month. You can join us today on a $349 a year annual plan. Now these prices are locked in, so they don't change once you join us and you can get full access for this, what is equivalent to $29 a month. So if you'd like to join us, here's the link, topmusic.co slash songwriting. We'll get you all the information that you need about what we offer inside Top Music Pro. And what I've talked about is really just tip of the iceberg stuff. And we're just talking about Simon's course. There's heaps of great resources and support for teachers in there. Uh, topmusic.co slash songwriting will get you um, access today of those special prices if you're not already a member. And we'll make sure we put that in the chat as well. Um, thanks, Nicole, for doing that. All right, fantastic. Well, I'm keen to wrap things up soon. I didn't want to take up too much time for everybody. Thank you, Nicole, for putting in the links to those two YouTubes as well. Uh, I can see the Elton John ones in there and the early one we talked about, which is great, Bob, Bobby McFerrin. Um, so if you've got any other questions, please let us know. And if you're in fact in the Zoom room, you're welcome to unmute and uh, say hi and have a quick chat with us if you'd like to. Hi everyone, this is Anna Marie and I'm calling while I'm driving. Very bad, I know. <laughs> as long as you're not looking at the screen, Anna Marie. Yeah, take care. <laughs> Anna Marie is um, 
Oh, well, Anna-Marie, you should mention what you're, because I just talked about the sessions you're running on Sunday, Mondays. Um, yeah, I am hosting it's Sunday uh, U.S. time eight, or Eastern Standard Time, 8 o'clock, which is um, one of many times Australia morning. <laughs> That's right. And uh, I, I said it's one of many times Australia in the morning. And um, we just get together for about a half hour to see how we can start our week right. And we pick a theme and stick to it for the week. And then we're going to come back and discuss it the following week and pick a new one. That's great. I appreciate it. And it was great to see it begin this week. And I know it's going to grow over time. So thank you, Anna-Marie, for that. Hopefully we'll get thank some questions you. about the uh, songwriting course as well in the process. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry, everyone, still getting over a cold from about a week ago. <clears throat> um, Brendan asks, is this course available to all Top Music Pro members or just Evolution? Um, and what Henley piece do I have on my music rest? <laughs> Someone knows their blue books. <laughs> um, Brendan, yeah, it's available to all levels of membership, Studio and Evolution. So <clears throat> our, we've got our light membership. So. For those of you, if you're interested in dipping your toe in the water more, uh, for $10 a month, you can join our Light membership. That gives you access to all of our webinar and live replays like this and our free monthly sheet music packs called Top Music Sheets, which is incredible value for, for $10 a month. Um, but that doesn't include our courses except for one course called our Studio Success Path course. So if you would like this course and all our other ones, our Studio Level is the one. Um, and what is it? I think it's Chopin. <clears throat> yeah, Chopin Skirtsy. I'm working on, I've been work, <laughs> working on two of these for about 10 years, I, <laughs> I think. Uh, Chopin is by far my favorite um, composer. Actually, if I look on my music rest, I've got, I've got a few. So I, I re, was revisiting this one, old favorite, Fantasy Impromptu. Oh, yeah. And my other favorite, which I've also been working on for about 14 years is the fantasy in F minor, which is also one of my favorite pieces of all time. Yeah. Oh, fantasy and the impromptu, Tim. Did you know there's a, the, the central theme of that was turned into a pop song? No, I didn't. <laughs> that tune? Yeah. There's, there's a song called, I think it's something like I'm Forever Chasing Rainbows. I say a pop song. It was it was like a sort of easy listening song from about 50, 60 years ago. <laughs> no way. Um, and uh, there, there's actually just sort of underlines my point. There's so many, so many classical pieces have cropped up in pop. Um, two, two songs you might want to go hunt if you don't know them. All By Myself by Eric Carmen, which was also done by uh, Celine Dion, is a direct pastiche of Ratmanov's second piano concerto. Hmm. Um, and there's a song by Billy Joel called This Night, which is uh, the slow movement of Beethoven's pathetique piano sonata. So uh, it just goes to show all the great, all the great um, um, classical masters wrote good pop music too. Love those connections. That's so cool. I'll uh, pack yeah, a ball cannon and coolio. Yeah, right. yep. I'll see you when you get there. I'll That's see it. you yeah. when you get there. Yeah. And, also, and in fact, it was all Pet Shop Boys. Well. Oh, Pet Shop um, Boys did Go West, which is also yes. that. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I um, love these kind of connections. In the course, we talk about the 1645 chord progression. Yeah. And I haven't done a count, but I wouldn't mind uh, uh, putting money on there being over 100 well known pop songs that use that chord sequence. I actually think it's over. 500 or something you can there's a wikipedia article about, about yeah, it i was being careful yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you mentioned axis of awesome in your course don't you and um, yes and they, did a, they did a thing on that yep um which nocturne are you working on brendan honestly i don't remember what which one it was da, 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 da. Uh. Yeah, it's kicking my butt, but it's fun. <laughs> but that's yeah, that's the Chopin for you. I, I I think it's just it's it's such great music for building technique though. Um, um, <clears throat> and I hope people um, 
don't take all my love of songwriting and pop and chords and all this the wrong way. I, I still, the value of classical music and classical education for students is, is so strong. And I still, it, when I'm practicing, that's, <laughs> that's what I'm playing because it, it makes me a better pianist. So, um, Rebecca says, my family's sick of me finding the pro that progression every time we listen to music. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, well, look, I would love to keep chatting, Simon. Simon. Oh, Nicole. Oh, Hi, I was Nicole. just going to ask, Simon, um, could you share just a little bit about how you got started? I think it's always inspiring to hear how we end up as teachers and composers. How I got started as a songwriter you mean or in music generally or yeah well I'm um, maybe if there's uh, one thing you want to share about getting started as, as a kid but then in, in songwriting especially yeah I, I I started learning the piano when I was seven because my mum's best friend started a piano teaching practice and was looking for a guinea pig pupil to work on that's literally how I got started on the piano um uh, but um songwriting uh yeah I, I went all the way through my teens trying to write songs and never never received that kind of any instruction or guidance in it so i probably learned the best way which was just by writing and writing and writing hundreds and hundreds of really bad songs uh, and subjecting them to my parents and anyone else in my family it became a kind of standing joke that if um if simon came round with his parents for tea at uncle and aunt so-and-so's house there'd be a tape put on with simon's latest song on it that he, he'd written he wanted people to hear and they were atrocious i mean like you know Gosh, it's so embarrassing even just to think of it. Um, and then uh, when I was, I mean, I went into teaching and I started working with students and started started honing my own songwriting in tandem with teaching it, you know, and with working with students and what they were doing, which is actually a great way to learn, isn't it? When you're a teacher, you, you learn through teaching just as much as being taught. Um, and uh, I started to get... Uh, um, I started to go to open mic nights and things like that and uh, met a publisher um, who, who wanted to sort of develop me and, and sort of went on from there really. So that, that's when I started getting commercial songs written and, and take, taken by singers. But it was a long process. It took a long time. To yeah. Well, that is amazing. I do have one more question though. When we have students who are dipping their toes into writing, especially, you know, these teenagers that are worried about sounding cheesy or worried about writing bad songs. Do you feel like that is just part of the process? You just have to tell your students, you have to write the bad songs before you can get to the good ones or how do we yeah. encourage them to get past yeah. that? Yeah, completely. You, you, you learn through doing and you have to be bad to get good. So, I mean, there's no, there's no, there's no way to become good instantly. I, mean, I don't think any, major artist, songwriter, composer started right by writing, maybe Mozart is an exception, but started by writing really, really good pieces from the age of four, you know. So so absolutely. And it's really hard when you're young and you're already unsure of yourself. And, um, you know, you, that's why um, technology is great. You can try stuff into your phone. You can listen stuff back yourself before you have to you know, play it to anybody else and risk embarrassing yourself. Um, but I talk a lot in the course about trial and error and that uh, there's no there's no right way to compose. That's really important. Um, and there's you don't need to know the theory. It's good to understand the theory and it's important to understand, um, you know, bolting back onto what you do, the theory, so that you can get better later. But when you're first starting out, just by using your ears, just play or sing and listen back and go, does that work? And if the answer is, yeah, I think it works, then it works. There's no, you know, there's, it's not right, wrong or 50% or 75%. If it sounds okay, it's okay. Um, so start from that point. And as teachers, just, you know, we just have to do all we can to encourage them and praise them and, and, and keep them, you know, coming back with more so that they, that stuff that's locked up inside everybody comes out. Well said, Simon. Thank you for that. <clears throat> um, any other quick questions from our Zoom or streaming audience? Uh, we'll start wrapping things up at the moment. Uh, I think one of the other advantages we do have today is that technology does allow our students to create some pretty cool backing tracks, orchestral sounding things using um, GarageBand, for example. I created a full course about how to do that related to four chord composing. 
but it would uh, work exactly the same for this. You know, you can get some pretty lush, rich backing track kind of sounds very easily from the software today, um, and GarageBand is just one of the many. Uh, Laura says, "Look, <coughs> excuse me." Laura says, "Looking forward to trying this." with all my students, especially interested in how an adult student who thinks he is tone deaf reacts to this. Yeah, it would be awesome to see him get confidence in his ability to create. I think you'll find that um, Simon's approach of playing the melody and using that small set of notes would definitely give confidence to an adult in that position. Wiggle your, wiggle your fingers, yeah. Place your fingers and wiggle them and see what comes out. I guarantee something good will come out within seconds. Yeah. Um, Simon, it's been wonderful to um, connect with you today. Oh, Emily's put a nice quote. We've, we've been sharing some of your quotes in the chat. <laughs> We're going to okay. save them and we'll add them to the course so that those songs that are locked up inside can come out. Um, and I grabbed an earlier one. You learn through doing and have to be bad to get good. I think that's great too. We have to all remember that. Um, so yeah, Simon, thank you so much. And uh, from the bottom, bottom of my heart, thank you for creating this incredible, it's a masterpiece. It really is such a great um, course and it's going to be so valuable to so many teachers. So a uh, big round of applause from, from everyone on their mute microphones. Thank you very much. <laughs> my, my absolute pleasure. It's been, it's been great fun. I've really enjoyed working with you guys and producing it. And thank you to your team for making it look and sound so great with all the editing and the post-production. Uh, Nicole had a big part to play, but I know other people as well. It's much appreciated. Absolute pleasure. And um, yeah, I know you're traveling to Australia soon, so we'll get to hang out, which I'm very excited by. Yeah, Australia uh, and New Zealand. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. End of this yes. And um, otherwise, I, I'm sure we'll keep um, keep in touch. And you're know, part, of, part of the top music family now, Simon. So um, <laughs> <laughs> whether you like it or not, we might be calling on you again. Um, thanks again, everybody uh, who's watching as well. It's been wonderful to hang out with you this morning, despite how early it is. Uh, and we look forward to getting your questions and hopefully seeing some of you in membership if you're not already um, inside our community. 